Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to provide an overview to the field of scientific computing. Historically, people have often spoken of science as having two pillars of theory and experiment. We make measurements and observations, and we use those to build theories of the real world. Over time, the interplay between theory and experiment has allowed us to refine our scientific ideas. Recently, computation has emerged as a third pillar of science, giving us a new set of tools and approaches that we can use for gaining scientific insight. And there are several reasons for this. Firstly, computation allows us to explore mathematical ideas that would be too difficult to solve analytically. And this is usually the case for many real-world problems that we encounter. Second, increasingly, in many fields, we're faced with the ability to collect large amounts of data on a scale that's too large to process manually. And computational methods really allow us to process data on this scale and gain theoretical insight. Over the last 50 years, we've really witnessed a huge growth in the power of computational hardware and correspondingly in algorithms. And this has steadily increased the importance of scientific computing. So what is scientific computing? Scientific computing is closely related to numerical analysis. And I want to start with a quote from Professor Nick Trefethen at Oxford, who says that numerical analysis is the study of algorithms for the problems of continuous mathematics. And while numerical analysis is the study of these algorithms, scientific computing more emphasizes their use in practical problems. And in Professor Trefethen's quote, the key word here is continuous. We're really interested in algorithms for use with real numbers, or perhaps complex numbers, as opposed to integers. And this really makes a key distinction between the field and many areas of computer science. In computer science, there's more of an emphasis on the algorithms for discrete mathematics, such as in graph theory or cryptography. Scientific computing enters into a huge range of fields, and I just want to illustrate some of them here. For example, in the field of cosmology, we can use scientific computing as a way to look at large-scale structure in the universe. In the simulation shown here, we're able to look at gravitational interactions that lead to galaxy formation. To do this, we've had to look at the gravitational interactions between many particles, and this is only something that's really feasible computationally. In the field of biology, scientific computation has grown rapidly in recent years. For example, we can use computational methods to predict how proteins might fold, and it provides us insight into these structures that would be very difficult to directly observe. In addition, there are many areas of biology where we're able to collect data on a huge scale, such as in gene expression, and computational methods really allow us to process this data and extract insight. Another important area is computational fluid dynamics. And historically, if you were designing an airplane or a Formula One car, then you might build a physical mock-up of your design and put it in a wind tunnel to analyze its aerodynamic performance. But an alternative to this is to build a computational fluid dynamics model to simulate the airflow around the design. This is cheaper and faster, and it also has the advantage that it's easier to iterate over many possible candidate designs to optimize performance. Another advantage of a simulation is that you often have complete information in three dimensions about what the airflow looks like whereas that's actually rather difficult to collect in a wind tunnel experiment. Scientific computing is also important in the field of geophysics. While we're restricted to collecting data at the Earth's surface, we can build computational models to simulate the Earth's interior. And we can really view this as an example of an inverse problem, where using limited data, we can really try and infer information about the interior structure. Even though what we think of as modern scientific computing has only developed over the last 50 years, the basic principles behind the field have been present for many centuries. There's always been a need to take mathematical concepts and actually calculate with real values from them. A really great example of this is the calculation of pi. And we can look back to antiquity to find that a number of approximations for pi were made. The Babylonians used a value of 3 and an eighth. And there's actually a verse in the Bible from the Old Testament that states, and he made the molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim, round in compass, and height thereof was five cubits, and a line of 30 cubits did compass it round about. And this was describing a bowl-shaped object with diameter 10 and circumference 30, and from here you can infer that pi is roughly 3. The Egyptians use a value of pi equal to 4 times 8 ninths squared, 
which works out to about 3.16. And you might ask, well, how did they come up with this value? And it actually dates from a very famous historical text called the Rhind Papyrus that consists of 50 worked examples of mathematical problems. And the last problem on this papyrus actually makes a statement that a circular field with diameter 9 has the same area as a square field with side length 8. And from here you can infer that pi would be equal to 4 times 8 9 squared. Archimedes made a number of important advancements in the calculation of pi. He was able to approximate pi by using inscribed and circumscribed regular polygons of different numbers of sides. And by looking at the area of those polygons compared to the circle and refining the number of sides in the polygon up to a total of 96 sides, he was able to calculate that pi was between 3 and 1071st and 3 and a seventh, which is a bound range of only two one thousandths. And it's really remarkable that this was done two millennia ago. And we see a number of real advances in thinking here. Firstly, he was able to approximate a continuous process, the idea of area integration, with a discrete process, the idea of evaluating areas of polygons. And secondly, he was able to recognize that pi was not just approximately equal to something, he was able to actually give a, an exact bound on where it actually lied. This is a really crucial idea in modern scientific computing. We often really want to know about the error associated with a certain calculation, and we'll see that throughout many points in this course. Throughout this course, we'll encounter many algorithms that are attributed to great mathematicians, such as Newton, Gauss, Euler, Lagrange, Fourier, Legendre, and Chebyshev. And they were all practitioners of, of scientific computing, mainly because in the fields they were interested, areas like astronomy and mechanics, there was a real need to actually do real calculations that had to be performed by hand. And because these calculations were so laborious, there was a real interest in finding more accurate and efficient ways to do them. Returning to the calculation of pi, one of the later advancements that was made was by James Gregory, a Scottish mathematician, and he discovered the arctangent series, where the inverse tangent of x is equal to x minus x cubed over 3, plus x to the fifth over 5, minus x to the seventh over 7, and so on. And if you put x equal 1 into this formula, then you find that pi over 4 is equal to 1 minus a third, plus a fifth, minus a seventh, plus a ninth, and so on. And that is actually one way that you can calculate pi using an infinite series. Unfortunately, though, this calculation only converges very slowly. You would have to evaluate many terms in order to approximate pi to any degree of accuracy. An advancement to this was made by John Mashin, an English astronomer, and he defined the angle alpha such that the tangent of alpha is equal to a fifth. And if you then use a double angle formula for tangent, you can write down that tan of two alpha is equal to five twelfths, and applying that again, you find that tan of 4 alpha is equal to 120 over 119. And that value is very close to 1. And using a further trigonometric formula, we can write down that if we look at tan of 4 alpha minus pi over 4, then that actually works out to be 1 over 239. And now if we take the arctangent of both sides and rearrange, we find that pi over 4 is equal to 4 times the inverse tan of a fifth minus the inverse tan of 1 over 239. And this formula actually converges much more rapidly because now we're taking the arctangent of a small fraction. And those fractions will have large powers and they will converge much more quickly. Machin's formula really led to a revolution in how people could calculate pi. And throughout the 1700s and 1800s, people progressively used Machin's formula to calculate more and more digits. This cul culminated in William Shanks, an amateur mathematician, who in 1876 calculated 707 digits of pi. And this was really the result of years of work and laborious hand calculations. But I wrote the 707 in red because it turns out that Machin actually made a mistake and everything after 528 digits is actually incorrect. 
It was only discovered in the 20th century once people had mechanical calculators that could accelerate the process. And there's an interesting short poem to Shanks. 707, Shanks did state, digits of pi he would calculate. And none can deny it was a good try, but he erred in 528. And I've always found this subject really fascinating. And I actually gave a talk several years ago at a local library where I covered many uh, pi facts and pi history. Those slides are available on my website if you're interested. So scientific computation and numerical analysis are really closely related, and each field really informs the other. In AM205, the emphasis is really on scientific computing, really interested in giving you the knowledge that you can use to be a responsible user of numerical algorithms for practical problems.